It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Daniel Hempel. Daniel, oh, I have a little more to say yet before he can come up. Daniel is an educator, an award-winning journalist, and the founder and president of Fostering Media Connections, a national nonprofit news organization dedicated to, to issues facing vulnerable children, youth, and their families. He has taught courses on the intersection of journalism and child policy at USC Sol Price School of Public Policy, UC Berkeley Goldman School of Public Policy, the University of Pennsylvania School of Social Policy and Practice, and through his Journalism for Social Change course offered on the edX online learning platform, he has written and produced stories about vulnerable children for many media outlets, many of which are listed in your program. Daniel earned an undergraduate degree in anthropology from UC Santa Barbara, a master's degree in journalism at USC, Annenberg School. Daniel, welcome. I turn the podium over to you. Hello, everyone. How are you? Um, it was nice to hear that I went to Santa Barbara at one point. You know, you start getting further along in your career and you forget about what you did when you studied in college way back those years ago. Um, I'm exceedingly honored to be here tonight because the work I do is really focused on trying to tell the stories of vulnerable children. Um, and vulnerable populations. And throughout that work, uh, I, I look out and I've found many social workers that I look to to understand the way these systems work, um, to understand how to find solutions to the problems that these children face, the children in the foster care system or the child welfare system. And I also know, and the reason why I really got into what I do is that I noticed very early on that the popular narrative in the news media, the one that we all consume, is focused on these isolated cases of tragedy. A child's death, um, a social worker who missed the signs that something bad was going to happen. And the result is that you have a public perception out there that the system that serves these vulnerable children is broken, that the workers in it are inept, and this not only hurts the children that are in the system by virtue of associating them with this broken system, but it also hurts the workers, hurts the morale of the workers, and, it, and, and, and maybe equally importantly, hurts the opportunity for the public to have the political will to support these systems that serve not only children, but vulnerable people. I think you know, the government has a very bad, does a very bad job of promoting what the government does well. And in the field of child welfare, I think this is exceedingly true. Um, and when we're talking about the work that drives me, it's really about changing what the perceptions of these systems are. How do you move past this isolated tragedy towards the more nuanced full picture of what the system is? Not because that's a PR pitch, but because that's the truth. And that's what's important. And when we think about it, um, we're talking about an issue that's not about 437,000 children in the foster care system today in the United States. We're talking about rates of investigation of American children across this country. That by the time they turn 18, one third of every child in America, according to researchers at Yale, will have been investigated for child abuse by their 18th birthday. For black families, that's one in five. I mean, one, 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 that's one half. So what you're talking about is a very big issue that has very big implications on the future of our society. And the way we cover it, I think, is inadequate. And that's why uh, we developed the organization we did. And what we've really, what I've mulled over throughout this time is the idea of journalism in the best interest of the child. So 
what that really means is that there has to be a marriage between the systems that serve children that are loath to have the reporter go in or the juvenile dependency courts that are presumptively closed in half the states in the country. And there has to be an agreement with those, um, with the systems that serve children and then also the journalists to trade transparency for responsible and ethical journalism. And when you do that, I believe you have an opportunity to really um, tell the full story. But it requires journalists to think about the best interest of the child above the interest of their own byline, their own uh, push to get a story out, and their desire to get a department head fired or um, get on the news. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about some examples of my work and others' work that has sort of led me to evolve towards embodying this ethos of what I think coverage should be. Um, and I'll leave with some ideas about how you make this kind of journalism, where you've got this marriage of the system and the journalists in a way to tell true stories possible. So it's not so it's 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 more of the standard than the anomalies. My first one of my first stories about foster care, I came across this. Uh, I knew I had written it, but I wanted to put it out of my mind. Um, and that's not a joke. I mean, it was I really didn't want this in my mind. But in 2007, I wrote a story for the LA Weekly. The headline was "Alleged Thieves Still on County Payroll." Um, my lead for that story was four Los Angeles County employees who allegedly diverted special funds intended for foster kids into nights on the town for themselves and their pals, and whose names have been vociferously protected by the government for a month, are still on the job. So this was a story about a mentoring unit within LA County's Department of Children and Family Services that had amassed a bunch of tickets to go to the play Wicked, which was the musical Wicked, which was very popular at the time. I see Mitch nodding. Maybe you remember this, this episode. And um, there was an audit, and it came out that, that these tickets were being used by some of the workers themselves. The backstory is that there was a budgetary, there was a reason for this. It doesn't ever look good, but they had to spend the money before the end of the year. But they're taking these tickets. Um, and I was stonewalled, stonewalled by the Department of Children and Family Services. They would not talk to me. They would not give me any information. So I worked around them and got the story I got. And I was so upset that I didn't get, you know, I think I became more aggressive in my coverage by virtue of them trying to push me out. Um, one insider in the county told me for that story about the department. The department counts on you, the media wearing yourself out. They are bigger and they are more numerous than you. They go on like cockroaches after the nuclear holocaust. That's not my words. Everybody is dead and they are still there. So this was the quote about the way the Department of Children and Family Services treated reporters at that time. The result of this was years later I ran into a man named Bill Gay who ran that mentoring unit. And Bill told me that after those stories, the unit got disbanded. So it's really hard to say that to a group of social workers. Um, it's sort of a mea culpa on bad behavior. And that was a real telling moment for me, that, that the words that we put into newspapers have real power. And that's not the way we have to do it. Um, so but then if I think forward, um, there were other instances where I started to evolve, and I think that um, they can be indicative of the way we can go. In uh, 2012, the state of California was trying to implement the extension of foster care to age uh, 21. In that year, there were 2,166 children that were, uh, that turned 19 the first year they rolled out this expansion. 
And because of that, uh, they, to save money when they did the deal at the state house, they made it so this was phased in. So you had these 2,100 kids who were going to get kicked out of the out of the, the benefits of the foster care system. There was a young man named David Colby um, who was 19, uh, who had Asperger's, um, who was in a foster home, but had gotten into UC Berkeley, and the uh, Contra Costa County wanted to terminate his case because he had turned 19 during that year when the other kids were getting extension of foster care. Kind of arbitrary. And I went down to the courthouse to write a story. I went down with a reporter from the San Jose Mercury News, and uh, we tried to get in. The judge kicked us out. Simultaneously, Judge Michael Nash had opened the courts here in Los Angeles County, allowing reporters in. Um, and so while we weren't able to get in, we were able to report around and get other outlets to cover that story. And that resulted in the state cleaning up this bubble and allowing kids like David and 2,000 others to get their services and get foster, extended foster care that year. Um, and about this point with openness of the courts and the, the access that the media gets, also while Judge Michael Nash was the pre presiding judge of the Juvenile Dependency Court, I had the um, incredible luck to work on a documentary film production with this beautiful life partner of mine, Lauren, um, wherein we were able to get access to the courts and uh, bring videos into the courts and uh, shoot an episode of Lisa Ling's show when it was on the Oprah Winfrey Network that told the story of the system. And I think the Department of Children and Family Services workers who helped us get that story done and that the people who were involved, including the families, we, we met a young woman who had just had her child removed. We were there in the court when she was told that she, her baby wasn't going to go home with her. And we were there to capture that. And by virtue of the transparency we were given, because of the environment that Judge Nash had, had tried to produce and which DCFS had stepped into, we were able to produce something that won an award, the National Association of Social Workers Award, which I'm very proud of because it's the National Association of Social Workers, but more importantly, was able to tell a full story of what these systems are in a humane way and with transparency with nobody getting burnt. I should note that Lauren sat over the edits on the episode, wrote the text, so I didn't really do that much. Um, but, you know, it was because it wasn't about stinging the system. It was about showing what was really happening. And that's the kind of storytelling we can do if we're willing not to focus in on only the salacious details and realize that the bigger stories are not the ones that always garner the headlines. Bigger stories are, I think, often the everyday work that social workers are doing and the everyday work um, and the everyday lives that these young people are leading. Um, so re more recently, um, I wrote a story about something to do with education policy in Rhode Island, okay, Rhode Island tiny state, but it's going through some stuff that will have some big, big implications. Um, I'll just read you the lead of this story and tell you what happened. Her mother deported, her father incarcerated, six-year-old B. Doe entered Rhode Island's foster care system in 2005. By 2017, the girl turned teenager had changed reg residences no fewer than a dozen times as she bounced through foster homes and treatment facilities. All that jostling meant repeated school changes, an experience faced by many foster youth that is known to hurt their academic prospects. That cycle was about to repeat its, itself again this past fall as Vito was beginning her senior year of high school. But this time, she had the federal law on her side. The, 
what happened was is that in Rhode Island, there was a federal law, the Every, Every Student Succeeds Act, which required that students were, that their schooling was paid for by the school district they were in before they made a school move. Um, in this case, we wrote that story, and the importance here is that I didn't need to use the young girl's name. I, I could just tell it from the documents I had. I didn't need to go diving into the pieces of her life. Another outlet picked it up, and just this month, um, or just late last month, the state of Rhode Island uh, state legislature issued some legislation to try to fix this up for girls like B. Doe. And this is these cases where when you are able to tell stories honestly that are not focused on all the terrible things, uh, you can get real change to happen. Um, so with that, I guess I would like to leave us with some ideas about ways we could do this more often, to make uh, storytelling that is uh, nuanced and doesn't focus on the worst, uh, the norm. And we spend all of our time trying to talk to other media outlets and get them to understand how to cover the nuances. Jacqueline and I were laughing about how hard to get all the requisite context into a story it is. My staff was here, many of whom will attest to our ability to write very long stories and maybe give very long speeches. Um, but we're working on it every day. Um, years ago, there was a California, uh, the Alliance for Children's Rights had run a bill to try to make sure that the courts were presumptively open, as Judge Nash tried. Um, that's something that I think could be revisited in the future. Um, there is a movement afoot wherein you have public, members of the public, Court Watch New York City, Coalition to End Money Bond in Chicago, Court Watch NOLA. Um, these are various organizations where people are going in and watching the functioning of the courts. I think this is another thing we can do. And um, in closing, I definitely want to know what people think when we get a chance to talk later, but if the system can afford transparency and the media can respect the lives of the people they cover, I think you can have a chance at journalism that does the best for the children of the system. Um, and I think that that's what we're going to need if we're going to engender the kind of political will sufficient to meet what is a very big issue, especially given the, the wide dispersion, dispersion of, of child abuse. So um, I appreciate the archives, and thank you very much.